The title of my talk is, well, I wouldn't want to make a dysfunctional game. Um, that's supposed to be italics. Uh, you know, you sort of expect markdown everywhere, but uh, when I submitted it to the program, actually, uh, you know, they, they, just, they just copied the plain text. So I, I thought I'd roll with it. It, it, it kind of looks neat, you know. Um, <laughs> okay, so I wouldn't want to make a dysfunctional game. This is going to be an anthropological exploration of Lisp and game development. Uh, so we're going to ask questions like, what kinds of games have people made in Lisp? What can we learn from their experiences? Uh, how do you know if someone used Lisp for a game? Don't worry, she'll tell you. <laughs> um, so uh, some of you might have seen this book before uh, by, by Conrad Barsky. The Land of Lisp, uh, it's a, it's a uh, book about how to program Lisp, is sort of fun fundamentally the idea, but uh, it does, does that by exploring, uh, writing little toy games. Uh, there's, there'll be no more about that. An incomplete and non-comprehensive list of games that use Lisp. Okay, so um, there was abuse in 1996. Some of you might have played this. Uh, one thing that it's notable for in gaming circles is that it pioneered the idea of using the keyboard to control movement and the mouse to control looking at the same time. Uh, what we care about, though, um, is a little bit more technical. Uh, this game had the engine written in C++, but the uh, the UI and game logic were all written in this Lisp scripting language that they wrote. Um, you can see a little sample of that here. Uh, I, hopefully that's big enough for you to see. Uh, so the way that this is structured um, is, okay, so we're looking at the, the HP up. Um, these are, uh, this def care uh, macro here defines a character in the game and registers a set of callbacks to it. Um, and then, so when uh, the, the player interacts with that character in the game world, then the callbacks get called. In this case, we're talking about uh, these little hearts right here. These are the, the health power-ups, right? And so um, here is your uh, callback that gets called, the, the HP up there. Um, you test that it's, it's touching and that you can give uh, the player health, and then uh, you know, there, there you have it. Um, the, all of the entities in the game are uh, defined using this system, and, and uh, they each have callback functions that are associated with them that are written in this little Lisp dialect. So that's sort of neat. Um, I bet some of you have probably heard of this game, uh, Crash Bandicoot in 1996, and uh, Jack and Dexter in 2001, uh, and, and all of the sequels of those, of course. Um, and a neat thing about these is that uh, first of all, they were written entirely in Lisp, or, or almost entirely. Um, but also, the flavor of Lisp that they used was, uh, again, totally, uh, totally custom, totally made explicitly for this purpose. Uh, Crash Bandicoot series used game-oriented object Lisp, and the Jack and Dexter series used uh, its predecessor, or rather its successor, uh, <laughs> game-oriented assembly Lisp, or Goal. So uh, let's take a look at, at what that uh, game-oriented assembly Lisp looks like. Uh, here you see a little snippet. Um, this is, hey, again, it's a callback. Uh, Old-fashioned games use lots of callbacks. Uh, look, at, look at this, though. They have typed function arguments. You see this right here. Uh, SP system, particle, uh, SP vec, those are all types. Um, and then you see this typical sort of common Lisp uh, let binding. Look at all of these parentheses. Aren't we lucky we live in closure land where we get to use vectors for this? Um, <laughs> and uh, here's another interesting thing down here, um, is this rlet, and uh, what that does is let you write code in assembly. This is where the name comes from, game-oriented assembly lisp. Um, you get to write stuff directly in assembly uh, when you need that sort of optimization, and uh, this construct here uh, allows you to guarantee that the, the values um, get stored into a register, and then you bind a symbol to it that you can call, uh, call that you can use from Lisp code. Um, so you get sort of the the high level uh, sort of abstract uh, view that Lisp gives you, um, and you also have this very gritty low level uh, control over uh, over what's going on. Um, so this was this was really neat. Uh, they. Uh, sort of invest in this because the, the team that, that built these games came out of MIT and they were all very sort of uh, 
you know, happy, happy to use Lisp, happy to do experimental things, and it turned out uh, to work very well for them. And pretty much all of the games that came out of Naughty Dog Studios used Ghoul or Goal um, until they got bought by Sony, and, and Sony put a stop to it, uh, as these sort of big companies do. Uh, so another game, another game to look at is Vendetta Online, which uh, again was sort of, a, sort of a popular one, some of you might have heard of this. Um, in Vendetta, the, uh, the game engine was written in C++, like the, the client code was all C++, but the server-side uh, NPC AI system was written in Common Lisp. So here's just a picture of some spaceships flying around. Um, these are what the NPCs often look like. They're the, these little bug-looking spaceships. Um, and one of the interesting things that they do is, uh, that was encoded in this NPC AI system is uh, they travel around in swarms uh, through, this, through this universe here. Sorry, you can't see my finger. Um, and uh, inside each of these little dots, you have this little star chart. And you can see these little asteroid belts in there. And uh, the, the bugs like to hop around between those asteroids. And a big part of the game is sort of hunting them down, trying to, trying to kill them, trying to get access to the asteroids. Um, and uh, so this was a you know a huge like MMO game, and, and so there are thousands and thousands and thousands of NPCs spawned at any given time, um, and they're all overseen by this this uh, this big uh, common list system that they wrote, um, and that gave you a lot of really cool things. You could connect a rebel on uh, the live AI system, and, and actually, so so I used to play this game. This one has a, a soft spot in my heart, and um, uh, sometimes one of the one of the developers would get online. Um, and they'd just be uh, connected into a REPL on the server, and instead of using the normal uh, NPC behavior, they would they would like script events. They would like play uh, play game master sort of, and and uh, spawn NPCs and, and have them do various things like pick, pick targets for them, that sort of stuff. Uh, it was it was really neat, uh, sort of a everyone against the devs kind of uh, dogfight environment that you get into that way. Um, uh, you could easily add new bots' behavior. They're all just callbacks, uh, you know, uh, callback hell. But uh, the, uh, the, the sort of cool thing about this is um, they have this huge system, but all the time they want, they're wanting to add new NPCs, uh, new behavior for those new missions that you interact with. And uh, adding this new stuff was all very easy just to sort of pile on top. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> The system uh, became unmaintainable. Uh, it, it just got huge. Sort of the original specification of what Deliverator was supposed to do just kept growing and growing and growing. And uh, it became very brittle uh, and was breaking all the time and consuming a tremendous amount of developer resources just to keep it running. So they rewrote it in Erlang. <laughs> Uh, recognizing, rightfully so, that they had actually kind of uh, reinvented the actor model of concurrency. So it was a good fit, actually. Um, there, was, there was actually a big fuss uh, on the forums about this because there were a number of Lisp nerds that played this game. And <laughs> when they said they were rewriting it in Erlang, there were actually a couple of people who threatened to leave the game. <laughs> I was not one of them, I promise. Um, okay, so there's also uh, Chroma Shift. It's a little game jam game, right? It's tiny. Uh, it, it was built in clo ClojureScript. It used the uh, Entity Component System architecture. Um, and one of the cool things about this is it demonstrates how rapidly uh, you can write a cute little uh, sort of uh, run around platformer game. Uh, and the Entity Component System architecture is sort of uh, something that a lot of modern games use. Uh, and so, uh, the same people that worked on this ended up actually building Lighttable, the editor, and uh, they, were, they were actually very inspired by the, the sort of entity component system architecture, and they have, uh, so, some of you may have seen uh, the, the talk about that. Uh, I don't remember what they call it, but uh, the sort of architecture inspired by entity component system, adapted for sort of uh, a, a user interface more than, a, than an actual game. Um, Okay, and then here's one of my favorites. This is, this is uh, Tuzong, is how you pronounce that. Um, this is written by David O'Toole, who's a huge fan of Common Lisp, again. Um, and he actually wrote his own uh, 
game engine thing called Zelf that Tuzong and a number of his other games uh, are, are implemented in. So, you know, here's, here's what the gameplay looks like. It's, it's these very simplistic graphics. Um, it's, it's really quite beautiful. Um, I, can't, I can't play the sound for you. I don't have any sound connected to this, but the, the soundtrack is really, really great and crunchy. And you're just this little robot that runs around and you have this block and you have to throw it at these, uh, these rectangles of color to collect color that you can then use to uh, shoot through the force fields and, and disable them. You can see, see how that's working. So it's this, this great little like puzzle roguelike game. Um, Zelf itself is really neat. Uh, is it a language? Is it an IDE? Is it a library? It's kind of actually all of those. Um, it's described as Emacs for games. Uh, what it gives you is... <laughs> Right. Um, some would argue that Emacs for games is actually just Emacs. <laughs> um, however, I haven't seen graphics this pretty in, uh, in Emacs list before. Um, and what Self gives you is uh, the ability to have a REPL that, that actually runs inside of your game that you don't even have to necessarily connect to. It's sort of, you can display your code alongside of uh, the game. And you get a sort of similar thing to this in, in Light Table, actually. Um, and uh, you can sort of modify uh, components of the game on the fly as you're, uh, as you're sort of iteratively developing it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat system. Um, it's all common Lisp, and it's, it's uh, I don't know that anyone uses it other than, than the author. Um, I've, I've sort of poked around with it a little bit. That's not necessarily to say that uh, it's, it's not usable, but um, it's, it's perhaps a little bit arcane. Um, so a big problem with, uh, with making games is that a lot of times you want to draw graphics. Um, they're sort of the, the majority of, of things that you think of as computer games have graphics associated with them. In fact, sometimes you call them video games. Um, and there are a number of philosophies about this. Um, you can get really down to the metal, use OpenGL. Um, there are some thought leaders that highly recommend this approach. Um, and in fact, one of them wrote a, a blog post about it, uh, one called Penumbra. Um, there's the SDL abstraction, the simple direct media layer, which is a little bit higher level. That gives you things like sound uh, along with your video. And uh, there are bindings to that, both in, in Clojure and in Common Lisp. Um, these are still super procedural, and, and you're mutating state all over the place. It's pretty gross. Um, too bad. Uh, this is what you get for interfacing with real hardware. Um, but you can hang a pretty picture in front of it, and, and maybe what that would look like is something like this. Um, what you want to do is, uh, is just abstract those away. Hide, hide them, hide them in, in some dark corner of your game and, and never interact with them directly. Uh, so if this was a true anthropological piece, we wouldn't really be very judgmental about it. But um, I, I like being judgmental, actually. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I feel like uh, this, this sort of exploration of the history of, of game development in Lisp has taught me a few things. Um, lisps are really easy to write. A very common thing to do, a very common theme across all of these, is actually just making your own language, make your own dialect of Lisp to write the game in that's sort of tailored to exactly what you need. Um, Ghoul does this, Goal does this, uh, Zelf is sort of uh, another sort of step in that direction. Uh, it might be more feasible if you're a big game development company. Uh, however, David O'Toole is just one person, he did it, you know, you can, you can too. Um, use an entity component system. It's, uh, it's, it's very elegant. You can sort of iterate on things very quickly. Uh, you can get a, a working product very quickly and uh, it's, it's very easy to sort of modify things and, and iterate on that. Um, embed a REPL. Everyone does this. It's amazing. If you have a live REPL inside of your game and can modify things on the fly, um, it, that just reduces the turnaround time between noticing something that you want to be different and actually making it so. And of course, you know this from sort of developing software that is not games, right? But uh, this holds so true in games where you want to do things like line up a jump just right so that the, the uh, player has to jump at exactly the right time in order to get on the platform, but you want to make sure that the platform is close enough that they can get to it um, or, or to dodge a spike trap or whatever. Um, and 
having a REPL plugged into your game so that you can just modify that on the fly and, and try it over and over and over again until you get the feel exactly right is just invaluable. I, I can't really describe uh, how, how much that helps in game development versus you know, the old model of write C++, uh, compile it, wait for a while, come back, uh, run, run your game, see what changed. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Good. I answer them all. <laughs> okay, there, there. What are some sort of forward uh, games, anything coming up for the future, anything using? It's hard to say because people don't usually talk about it until it's out. It's so proprietary, you know? Um, however, there's, there's a few answers to that question. So um, David O'Toole's games are all open source. So you sort of know what he's working on, right? And uh, he has a, uh, a much grander game written in uh, Zelf that is uh, sort of a, one of these like 4X space exploration games. Um, and uh, you'll be sort of fly flying around in a little spaceship and, and uh, going to uh, planets and collecting resources and, and fighting aliens and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you know, there's 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 a thousand different sort of little indie game developers. Um, if like how many how many people in this room have toyed with writing a game in any sort of Lisp dialect? Yeah, there you go. So uh, so it's happening, you know. And uh, if if you sort of limit your search to to big fancy uh, AAA studios, then you won't find much because uh, they tend to be very uh, very reactionary and very sort of locked down about the, the technologies that they're willing to use. But um, if you look in the the uh, sort of indie game development. Uh, community, it's it's really flourishing. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, it doesn't seem more common. There seems to be this uh, idea that um, Lisp is just intrinsically too inefficient to handle game development. Like we've all heard that one. Yeah, and it's frustrating because you love the language and you want to use it. Yeah, totally. Um, well, a few things. So first of all, with modern computers, performance doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> that's, that's true in the rest of the world, right? And that's, that's totally true in games, too. Uh, it, except it, it does sort of matter, right? But, it, but what matters is getting your algorithms right, um, making sure that you don't have any pathological loops that, uh, that are just running in like grossly exponential time or something like that. Um, but the other thing is that there are libraries to interface with the, the, the parts of the code that need to be the most performant, the, the graphics layer, um, the, the rendering and stuff like that. And it really is okay for that not to be written in Lisp while most of the game still is. In fact, if you use an off-the-shelf library like Lisp Builder SDL for, um, uh, for Common Lisp or if you use uh, Play Closure for Closure, um, you really don't have to think about that at all. And you still get all of the performance benefits of using C++ or Java, respectively. Tune in next year. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone.